anyway, this class, unlike the other classes that we've done that might not have affected everybody, to some degree or another, everybody is touched by spiritual rebellion. Okay, and as I teach tonight, you'll see why that, you know, you might, maybe you could say, oh, Judy, your hair looks cute. <laughs> you got a cut? Looks very cute. Um, sorry, that was just a little um, girl noticing girl. <laughs> um, so, you know, sometimes you could say, well, I didn't have sexual abuse, or I don't have a heart of stone, or I didn't have this, or I didn't have this. This kind of touches everybody in some area of their life. So this lesson is about the way we reject ourselves, our lives, thus rebelling against the God who made us and the life he made for us. This teaching will help you identify the attitudes which indicate the problem and discuss the ramifications of this in your life. It's very eye-opening. Even as I, I did it again, I, I, I've taught this class a bunch of times, and I've taken it probably, let's see, we're 20 years old, probably 18 times, okay? And every time, I'm like, Lord, I got to read this prayer again, because I really think I have this dyslexia part of this lesson. And it's not just dyslexia, like you write your letters backwards. It, it's a spiritual dyslexia, okay? So... The scripture, um, the first scripture is Proverbs 19.3 in the Amplified. It says, the, foolish man, the foolishness of a man subverts his ways, ruins his affair, then his heart is resentful and frets against the Lord. What is spiritual rebellion? It's fleeing from the creator and the life he has given you. It's not just wishing your circumstances are better or that things would change in your life. It's not even hurt or anger. It's actually a deep anger filled with rejection because of the life that God called you to embrace. You want me to say that again? <laughs> it's a deep anger filled, filled with rejection of the life God calls you to embrace. We all have it to some degree, and you'll see why. The word rebellion in the King James Dictionary is an open or avowed renunciation of the authority of the government to which you owe allegiance. Resistance to lawful authority. So that would be God, right? He's our authority. He's the ultimate authority. So who is the author of spiritual rebellion? Satan. So it started before creation. That's how deep this is. So listen to this. Isaiah 14 in the message, which I think is the best version of this. It says, now you are nothing as we are. Make yourself at home with us dead folks. This is where your pomp and fine music led you, Babylon, to the unknown world, private chambers, a king-sized mattress of maggots of repros, and a quilt of crawling worms for warmth. What a, a come down, this O Babylon, day star, son of the dawn, flat on your face in the underworld mud, you fame, uh, famous for flattening nations. You said, I will climb to heaven. I will set my throne over the stars of God. I will run the assemblies of angels that meet on the sacred mount whatever that is, I will climb to the top of the clouds and I will take over the king of the, as the king of the universe. But you didn't make it, did you? Instead of climbing up, you came down under with the underground dead down to the abyss of the pit, okay? So right there, Satan rebelled against who God made him to be. He didn't like who God made him to be. He wanted to be God, so he's like the author of spiritual rebellion. For everything else, it starts in the garden. That started before the garden. But I could, my favorite saying is, everything started in the garden. You could trace anything that you're going through back to the garden, because that's where it really started. So I'm going to read you a little story. Okay. There was once a single dad, a righteous man to all, his son and daughter, although grown now, still lived at home. His role of mother and father, while challenging at times, seemed to be going very well. He had taught them 
as best he could about life, love, respect, and the value of intimacy and relationship, and how choosing righteousness would be the pathway to success in life. He had also warned them about sin and its consequences. He told them plainly, if you choose sin, you also choose the consequence and the destruction it will bring into your life. One day, when the father was not home, a stranger came and engaged the children in conversation. He said, it seemed to be a, sh a pleasant sort, and what um, he had seemed very attractive, although it differed somewhat from what the father had taught them. The longer they listened to the stranger, the more convinced they became that he had their best interest at heart, and although urging them seemed to go against what their father had taught them, they felt that they could see the personal benefit of following this stranger's advice. When their father came home, he called to them, but they didn't answer. He continued calling while looking for them throughout the house. Finally, they appeared from their hiding place, and the father immediately knew something was wrong. He asked them, what have you done? They explained about the stranger and the decision to follow him and his advice. The father was brokenhearted by what he heard because he knew the loss of his children would bring suffering as a result of their choices. It would be devastating, not to mention his own loss. His family would be separated and generations that followed would suffer loss. As gently as he could, he told them they would have to gather their belongings and leave home, he, the home he had prepared for them. He said, from this day on, you will work to provide yourself with food, clothing, and your own home. The consequence of your sin is heavy upon you. Go and find your destiny. The children's choice to rebel against their father's counsel brought devastating results. They lost the intimate relationship they had with their father. They lost the home he had prepared for them. They lost the food and clothing he had provided for them, and now they were alone on their own without provision for the necessities of life. This was a shocking dilemma to them. What do you think their reaction was to their circumstances? Naturally, we are all free to speculate about this situation any way we want. However, the purpose of the story is to consider in some detail the, the potential consequences of your own choices. So really, who's the story about? Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve, spiritual rebellion, started before the foundation of the earth, but then Satan passed it on through mankind in the garden. When you think about spiritual rebellion and you think about who God made you to be, spiritual rebellion is all about the enemy stealing your identity. It was what he did in the garden. He stole their identity because they were perfect, right? And when we think about, oh, well, you know, sometimes we don't think about if we give up our identity, it's, we think it's all about us, right? Well, who am I hurting? I'm just not doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm not hurting you. Am I hurting you, Alan, if I don't do my destiny? Yes, yes I am. But the enemy tricks you into thinking that you're only hurting you. Because it's always all, spiritual rebellion is all about us. And that's where the enemy gets you focused. In the garden, what did he do? It's all about, oh, what God's not going to do for you, right? He got them on what they felt like they were going to lose out on. So it became all about them instead about, what's going on around them. It gets your eyes off of God too, right? So what is your purpose? If I ask you to raise your hand, how many of you in here know your purpose? Okay, some of you other girls better get your hands up because <laughs> I'll start calling out your purposes from up here. <laughs> okay, we're here to have unconditional relation, a love relationship with our Father and to worship him. If nothing else, that is your number one purpose. 
then it's to fulfill whatever he has you do for the kingdom. It's really not just about us. It's not just about our families or what we have or what we can, you know, do. It's about what God has for us to do. If you don't know your purpose, you're going to go flitting off, looking for the counterfeit. The enemy is going to be able to hook you with the counterfeit, which gives you no satisfaction. And then you go look for another sat. Then you go look for the next thing. It never fulfills it. God has a destiny and a purpose and a plan for every single person in this room. And just like snowflakes, none of them look alike. And, you know, what the enemy gets us with is then jealousy, doesn't he? Because, you know what? He gave Easter better gifts than he gave me. I could sit there and go, well, you know what? Easter does this and I don't do that. Or... Latoya does that gift, and I don't have that gift. And then you're sitting there going, oh, well, if God just did that, then I'd be good. Hmm. Can you wear Saul's armor? That's putting on Saul's armor. When you want to be somebody else's gifting, that's Saul's armor. Because guess what? If, God put, if you put it on, you usually fall flat on your face. Because you can't do it. It causes jealousy and envy. What if your purpose, when you don't know it, causes you to sin? And it causes you to lose intimacy with God and disconnect from your inheritance. Now, if we have time, I'm going to show you how an orphan spirit, which I think pastor taught in one of the classes, right? About an orphan spirit, where that connects with spiritual rebellion. It's the same thing from a different viewpoint. So I'm going to show you how that connects, but orphans don't have inheritance, right? right. Spiritual rebellion, you are actually saying here, Easter, you can have my inheritance or here devil, you can have my inheritance. That's what that's doing. Sorry. I just walked off the camera. Okay, what if, what if Jesus didn't know his purpose? What if he rebelled against his destiny? Ooh, ouch, right? What if he said, yeah, I don't like what you've got here for me. I'm a carpenter's kid. What am I doing? Hey, John the Baptist looks like he's got some stuff going on that I don't have going on. What is if he compared himself to that? And how many times did Satan try to get Jesus about his destiny and his purpose? How many times? Three times, right? If you, you know, always asking him. And then how many times in the word does it say, who are you? Who are you? Who do you say I am? How many times did the enemy torment him with that? So see, there's nothing new. Even Jesus got tormented by the enemy on his identity. So we should think we're not going to get it. What if in spiritual rebellion, it's really hard to stand still. Um, if Jesus, God said to Jesus, they're in heaven. And he says, listen, son, I have an assignment for you. I want you to go to that, down to earth. And while you're there, you're going to be considered a bastard child because you weren't, and I'm not cursing, an illegitimate child because you're not, your mother and father weren't married when you were conceived. And people are going to hate you. They're going to spit at you. They're going to mock you. Then they're going to put you on trial. They're going to beat you with a cat and nine tails that has lead pieces in it. They're going to put a crown of thorns on your head. They're going to stick a sword in your side. They're going to torture you in a crowd of people. And the people that you loved are going to betray you. Hey, Jesus, do you want to go to, down to the earth? When's if he said, no, I don't want to do that. Right? What if? 
what would, what would your answer be if that was you? <laughs> no, right? There's a raise going, heck no. <laughs> okay. So with that spiritual rebellion would say, if you had the choice to have different parents, would you change your parents? Somebody said yes very quick. I didn't see who it was. Would you have chosen your looks? Would you have chosen your weaknesses? If your answer in your head is no, that's spiritual rebellion. And rebellion towards God. So would you choose your siblings or your family? Your gender. Now, how about that? Your gender, right? Now, when this was written, there was no such thing as all this stuff that's going on right now. This is just, you know, you were born a boy and your parents wanted a girl, or you want, you thought, you know, so you thought, oh, I should be girl because I'm gonna be like a boy, so my dad loves me. But you're not gonna like change your gender, you know, but. What about your social status or the time you were born in life? This little handout that I gave you, I want you to take a couple of minutes and I want you to go through it and fill it out. Nobody's going to see it. I'm not asking you to see it. If you're sitting with your spouse, you don't have to show them. It's a very private thing. But just take a couple of minutes and um, fill it out. It's both sides. whoever that's for. Um, so read in those questions. However you answered those questions in a negative way, that would be spiritual rebellion, OK? That is dishonoring and disliking what God created, which he doesn't really like. It's an indication of your anger at the Father for your dissatisfaction with his provision and his choices for your life. It also indicates the degree that you don't like yourself or are you re you're rejecting yourself. And remember I said about comparison and envy, you know, that's what the enemy did with Adam and Eve. I mean, they were perfect. Could you imagine? That was God's f masterpiece. A masterpiece. She must have been the most beautiful woman, and he must have been the most attractive man. I mean, God said, like, that was the first people. I, he wasn't going to make ugly, right? So they were perfect. They lived in the perfect place. They had the perfect God. Yeah. Everything was perfect. Yeah. And the enemy still got them to cause, cause them to walk into spiritual rebellion not being satisfied with what the Lord had done for them. So I think we could give ourselves a little break because we haven't had all the perfect and when we make mistakes. And I remember, I forget who said it, and I thought, that is so good. Like, you know, when if you're a parent and you've beaten yourself up because you haven't been like the perfect, like your kids do something that you wish they hadn't done, and you go, oh, if I had just been perfect, that wouldn't have happened. Well, that's just not true because God was the perfect father, and his kids still messed up, all right? So remember that. <laughs> all right, so all, all roads lead back to the garden. <laughs> um, Jeremiah 1.5 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and I approved you. God's stamp of approval is on you. God's stamp of approval is on you. So. You're saying, so that would be like the butcher stamping the cow and saying, you are the finest grade of meat that there is. And the cow going, no, I'm not. I'm chopped, chop, or chop, whatever it is, chopped meat, okay? And the, the butcher's going, no, you're the finest grade of meat. I don't even know what it is because I'm not a meat eater. But whatever it is, USDA grade, whatever. And if, no, I'm chopped, chop, no, 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 no. See, they just put me through the grinder as chop meat and make hamburgers out of me. That's not, I'm not the sirloin or the top thing. 
that's what it would be like. That God's stamping his approval on you and you're saying, no, I don't agree with you. Who are we to not agree with God? That's a dangerous place to be because that's where the enemy has a foothold. Psalm 139, 14, and this is also from the message. It says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You made me inside and out. You knew every bone in my body. You knew exactly how I was made bit by bit. How I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared before I ever lived one. Bit by bit, the Father put you together. Bit by bit. The enemy tries to stick his bits in there. But God made a perfect bit by bit when he made you. Now, you might not agree with him, but whatever it is. I mean, he didn't make Jesus, you know, good looking. He could have said, well, you know, John the Baptist is way better looking than me. Why didn't you make me good looking? Maybe people would have been attracted to me. Maybe people wouldn't have crowned my head with thorns. Do you ever think about that? When we're saying something about being ugly or, oh, I don't like my nose or I don't like this, I don't like that. You know, Jesus wasn't, it says he was lowly. But what about if you started saying, if Anthony started saying, you know what, God, I don't like this bit. And Andrea said, you know what, Lord, I don't like this bit and this bit and this bit. And Mary Ann said, you know what, God, there's a, like a bucket full of bits I don't like. And I want to get, what would you say? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, what happens if we started saying, I don't like that bit and I don't like this bit. And what about if that bit was the bit that was the key to your destiny. But God, you know what? You know what? When I was a kid, the gift of discernment is a really hard gift to have when you're a kid. But you have all your gifts when you're, whether you're three years old or whether you're 100 years old. Your gifts are your gifts. So as a kid, the gift of, the gift of discernment didn't serve me well because I love to talk, if you didn't get that by now. I love to talk. So, and I love to see what I say. And a prophet came in and she said, you love to see what, say what you see. And I was like, mm, yeah, that got me in trouble a whole lot in my life. But as a child, I would just see what I said. I would say what I saw. And adults didn't like that. And I would get shushed. I'd get punished, you know. So in my heart, I was like, I don't want this gift. I didn't know it was a gift, but I don't like this, and I'm not going to do this anymore. So I was pulling that bit out and putting it in the bucket that said, nope, don't like it. For a while, I wasn't, well, I'm not going to say a while. I am going to sleep in Jesus' name, but... There was a, a time period where the dreams were so intense in my life that I would be driving and the dreams would start coming and I didn't know if it was reality or if it was the dream. And it, it's really disturbing when that happens on a consistent basis, day after day after day. And I said, God, I don't want these dreams anymore. I took the bit and put it in the garbage. Not in the garbage, but I put it in the bucket. Nope, don't want that. Pretty soon... You're giving away your gifts. You're taking the bits and putting them in the, in the bucket. Right. Saying, no, God, you made a mistake with that one. That one gets me in trouble. That one, that one robs me of my peace, it feels like. And then all of a sudden I realized for a little bit of a season I didn't dream. And I was like, oh, my gosh, what did I do? That's how God speaks to me in dreams. But I took that bit and put it over there because I didn't like it. So what happens if we take out so many bits that we don't like about ourselves that all of a sudden, I love it. I got to tell you this joke. The lady was saying, 
God, I've been asking you and asking you. I've been praying and praying and praying, and you're not answering my prayers. Don't you even see me or know who I am anymore? And he goes, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't recognize you. She had so many plastic surgeries. He's like, I didn't recognize you anymore. But how about... How about, I know it's funny, I didn't tell, I'm not a good joke teller, but you got the point, right? <laughs> um, you got the point. So what if we took out so many bits of us that God goes, oh, wait, I didn't recognize you, Cindy. That's not how I created. That's not who I made you to be. Hey, I don't like this gift. I want to be, I want somebody else's gift. So I start putting that on, putting my bits in the can and taking other people's bits. You know, putting a square peg in a round hole does not work. But we do it, don't we? We do it all the time because the devil wants the same thing to happen to us that happened to him, to lose his identity. Remember, he was the most beautiful of all the angels in heaven. He was the worship leader. Hey, I think that's a pretty good job. I would love that job. And he, that wasn't good enough. So he wants us to give up the same thing. In 1 Samuel 15, 23, it says, Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as idolatry. So when we're in spiritual rebellion rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft we are allowing the enemy in we are allowing the enemy in do you hear what i said we when we are in spiritual rebellion cindy corman is allowing the enemy in when easter fraser is in spiritual rebellion she's allowing the enemy in because it says it's as the sin of witchcraft I don't know, but like when you think about it like that, like the enemy's so slick, he gets you to like kind of like laze into it, you know, and you kind of don't even realize it. But when you think about it like that, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm openly stepping into witchcraft. And then you know all well, the things you do, because then you start to control and manipulate and, you know, right? You start to try and get what you want and how you want it and try to change things to get it the way you want it. You change, start changing your looks. You start hanging with different people. Hmm, yeah, right? Okay. That word rebellious there means to be um, disobedient towards the Father, towards God. Okay. Maris, can you put up slide number one, please? Spiritual rebellion is the result of four basic God-given needs being unmet to some degree. Okay? It's the unconditional expressed love that every child needs. Every child, every human being needs it. They, um, one of the uh, CDs, I think it's in the um, emotional abuse, which we're not going to be doing this time, but it says that a child that is love and nurture is withheld from is emotional abuse because it's one of the basic God-given needs in our life. Affection and affirmation, security and safety, purpose for living. See, I told you. I said the words backwards. To the degree that these four basic needs are not met by our family of origin, to the degree that we are rejected or wounded and have a love deficit, this wounding can even begin in the womb. So it is a fact, it's not, it's a scientific fact that babies in the womb hear and their emotions are affected. And you can make judgments in the womb, you can make vows in the womb, you can be totally affected in the womb. So if you weren't wanted, if you were a threat of an abortion, if you were the wrong sex, you know, sometimes families have three girls and they really, really want a boy. That could cause wounding to the baby in utero because they hear. So, and if you talk about, um, 
I'll give you an example. When um, my grandson was um, conceived out of wedlock, and there was one day that um, his father's mother was at my house, and we were supposed to have like this family meeting, and it went awry, that's all I'll say. It went awry. And my daughter was sitting on the step in the foyer next to me, and his mother was standing in front of me. And we have a very good relationship now, but it was a very t intense situation at the time. And it got very loud. And I could see my grandson flipping almost in her womb. It was like her belly started to like shake and move. And I was like, this is over. There's the door. We're done. It was, you could see the trauma that was going into this baby. So this is real. So it even can happen in utero. Slide number two, Marissa. All right. Negative answers. Um, the negative answers that you put there help you, would I, help you to identify spiritual rebellion. There's a lack of freedom to be yourself. There's deep wounds or guilt. Oh, that's the wrong one. That's for, uh. Yeah, that's where we are. That is a really good one. We can go back to that in a second, Marissa. Um, rebellion and anger against God and murmuring and complaining against God. Oh, nobody's ever done that, right? No, 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 no. The, the King James Dictionary says murmuring is a low sound, continued or continually repeated. Complaining is expressing dissatisfaction, pain, unease, resentment, grief, to find fault or annoyance about the state of affairs or an event, to whine, to grumble, Right? Now listen to this. This is from, do you ever hear of Dennis Rainey from Family Life? Yeah, yeah he's great, right? I love that guy. It says, like sulfuric, sulfuric acid, complaining eats away at whatever it splashes on. Complaining erodes joy and dissolves good attitudes. Spiritually, it's dangerous and deadly, as you will see. The Bible speaks of complaining in a picturesque language. The word is ana, A-N-A, -A, to habitually sigh. Sigh let, is like letting air out of a tire. Even when it stops, the air continues to escape. So just think about, have you ever been with somebody who's always going, <sighs> <sighs> it's just like, all right, what's your problem ready? Just tell me what your problem is because <sighs> it's just like you want to go, as Pastor Trisha says, get the spirit of smack on you. <laughs> All right? But that's what it is. So just think about when we're complaining to God and we're sighing at him. Oh, wow. hmm, nobody's ever done that, I'm sure. All right? He, he probably wants to get the spirit of smack on you too. Um, even though he's so merciful, <laughs> we, if it was us, we'd want to smack you. Um, all right. In the new Testament, it's the word, um, E M M P S, which means to find fault in one's lot. Even feel the circumstances aren't fair. Did you ever find fault with what God is doing in your life? Never, right? They're all shaking their heads the opposite direction. Okay. I wonder, this is, this is from his book. It says, I wonder what you would find if you did a little open heart surgery on a complainer. Exploratory surgery will reveal the grumbling can be in the form of heart disease. Rebellion against authority. In Job 23, 2, it says, So once again, you are telling me my complaint amounts to rebellion. My dad used to say, um, I used to say, how you doing, dad? He goes, I'm great. 
He goes, there's no use in complaining because it doesn't change a thing. And I always used to say that. And so one day I was there and I was going through a really hard time for a long period of time. And my I said to my dad, how you doing, dad? He said, I'm doing great. How are you doing? He said, you don't need to tell me. He said, I can see it on your face. It's starting to change who you are. He said, the only thing that complaining changes is the person who's doing it. And he said, you need to go pray. I was like, ouch. But I knew he was right. The only thing complaining does is change the person who's doing it. It does nothing else. It gives the devil a big fat foothold. In um, Numbers 14, 26 through 30 in the Living Tra New Living Translation, it says, then the Lord said, this is what the word says about complaining. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, how long must I put up with this wicked community and its complaints about me? Yes, I have heard the complaints the Israelites are making against me. Now tell them this. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I have heard you say. You will all drop dead in this wilderness because you have complained against me. Every one of you who is 20 years or older and was included in the registration will die. You will not enter and occupy the land I swore to your fathers. That's pretty stiff punishment. But think about it in terms of the garden. What happened? They didn't die physically, but they died, right, spiritually. So you can just translate that here as there's a spiritual death that goes on when you're complaining. Maybe you're not going to drop dead like it says here, like you're going to fall over and drop dead, but parts of you start to die when that's all you do. Okay? When we reject life, we dishonor and hurt God. We refuse his gift of life and hope, and we refuse to trust him. The rest of that little Dennis Rainey piece says, at other times, complaining is a loss of perspective, a failure to remember who is in control. And that's where the enemy had me when I was complaining. It was a loss of perspective and forgetting that no matter what the circumstance that I was living through looked like, that God was still the one in control. An attitude that wonders, does God really know what's best for me? Ouch, right? Jude 16 tells us that complaining germinates in a selfish heart. There are grumblers finding fault following their own, after their own lusts. But generally, it's a person who is dissatisfied with his own lot in life. The circumstances God has allowed to come his way, the Israelites' grumbling was only symptomatic as far more um, fatal disease, which is unbelief, a lack of faith that God knew what he was doing. How many of us could say, yeah, been there, done that, right? Wondering, God, do you really know what you're doing right now? Did you fall asleep? God, are you sleeping? Can you wake up? Because I don't know if you know what's going on right now. I don't know how if you know that the devil is wreaking havoc. Wow. It's what they said on the boat, right? The, the, the storm is going and Jesus is sleeping. Jesus, Jesus, where are you? What's the problem? You think I don't know what's going on? Say la. He always knows what's going on. He's always five days ahead of us. He's always knows everything that's going on. He's already been in those days, made provision, protection, safety, and strength for all of us. But the enemy torments us and says, oh, where's your God now? Where did he go? Is he sleeping? And then you start thinking you're saying, is God, are you sleeping? When the enemy's whispering in your ear, where's your God now? 
Is he going to show up for you now? Right? Spiritual rebellion. Remember we sang before, he is perfect in all his ways. And he wastes nothing. There's not one thing that's ever happened to you in your life that God will waste and not use for his glory, if you allow him to. I remember, I'm not going to go into what happened, but I remember the day I was power walking up this hill and I, the Lord stopped me dead in my tracks. And I verbally said out loud, if I lived through that so I can do this and you can get the glory, then I count it an honor. And I meant it with every fiber in my being. And I think, I can't believe I just said that out loud. But I meant it. It was like, okay, Lord, you're going to use everything the enemy meant for evil in my life for your glory. And if you allow him to let use you in that way, you will see that it wasn't wasted. Because what the enemy meant for evil, God will use for his glory if you allow him to. In Jeremiah 29, 11, we all know this. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Remember Joseph? Do you think Joseph ever thought, God, do you know what you're doing? Yes. Joseph puts me to shame. This is, I, I'm reading this out of a, a book. It says, he was thrown into a pit by his brothers, sold into slavery, unjustly accused of fooling around with Potiphar's wife, thrown into pr prison, forgotten by his friends that he helped, and yet the scripture doesn't give one account, not a single account of him complaining. He could have been bitter, but he wasn't. He bloomed where he was planted. He could have smashed his fist against the wall in the prison and said, how did I get here? This is not right. But he didn't. He bloomed there. It wasn't even like he just sat there. He bloomed there. He prospered there. Because he put a zip on the lip, as uh, Trisha's mom would have said, put a zip on his lip and he bloomed and he allowed God to do what he was doing in a process it was a process, and God used every one of those horrible things for his glory and to bring him into the second in command of the nation. Wow. Now, would you have thought along the way? You could have been in a major spiritual rebellion, but he just went with it. He prospered. He grew. He blessed people in it. He did the best he could do in the situation he was in. And he grew and he grew and he grew to the point where God used him to be the second in command of a nation because he allowed God to do a process Amen. without complaining. Amen. Wow. I got a lot to learn. <laughs> okay. What's the secret to a complaint-free life? Here it is. This is what it says in Genesis 45, 5 through 8, where you find Joseph, now the governor of Egypt, addressing his starving brothers. He says, and now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because God sent me here before you to preserve your life. Three times in four verses, Joseph says, God sent me here. Talk about a perspective that comes as a result of an uncommon faith in an omnipotent God. Joseph grasped, grasped the truth that God was in control of his life. Wow. That God was in control of his life and he, God knew what he was doing. Despite the fact that his brothers threw him and left him to die. Unrightly, unjustly accused of trying to go after the wife, thrown in prison, and look what he did. He prospered him in that. Maybe that bit you want to throw out or that piece of you that was broken, we want to pretend isn't there. Oh, I don't want that. I, I just, oh, I don't ever want to think about that again. Maybe that bit 
is going to help somebody else get free. How about that? How about when you use what the devil, the devil did to you to get somebody else free? Listen, I can tell you there is no greater joy than when you get to cut his head off. Now, this is on Facebook. I shouldn't have said that, but figuratively. Like when you get to destroy him in the area where he tried to destroy you, let me tell you, you're doing a hallelujah dance. You're going to do a hallelujah dance. So don't want to be throwing that bit in the garbage because you're going to need that. Don't rebel against that. You're going to need that for what God has for you to do. Amen. And when the devil's telling you, oh, you don't want that, and you, you start rebelling against God, oh, no, devil, that bit's going to be used to destroy the works of darkness in somebody else's life. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, what are the symptoms of spiritual rebellion? Death wishes. Okay, prone to accidents, diseases or allergies. Yes, ma'am. Okay, even if you have a lactose intolerance, it could be spiritual rebellion from conception when you weren't wanted and you reject, rejected the milk from your mother. Okay? Um, in Proverbs 18, 14, it says, A man's spirit sustains him in sickness, but a crushed spirit, spirit who can bear. Okay? So if you have those things, maybe you have to look to see if there's a spiritual rebellion. Sure. The, the scripture? Oh, the things, death wishes, prone to accidents, disease, or allergies. When the doctor says, I can't find anything that you're allergic to. All right, disrupted coordination. Your body and your spirit are not in harmony when you're in spiritual rebellion. It says in Matthew 12, 25, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. So when you're in rebellion, one second, sweetie. When you're in rebellion against yourself, you're a house divided because God said this about you and you're saying this about you. That means there's a divide and it means you can't stand because a house divided cannot stand. And if you're a house, a temple of the Holy Spirit, and you're divided in your spirit, how are you going to stand? Bukwaya? That's like somebody who has, I'm telling you, if you see them No. Wow. That's interesting. Oh, and the body and the spirit aren't in alignment, in harmony. I'm not, I'm not quite getting it, but so they carry an EKG around all the time to do it. Because if they went to the hospital, they would say they were having a heart attack because their EKG isn't normal. Wow. Well, they might have spiritual rebellion. There you go. You could go to them and tell them. Yeah, so it's your body and your spirit aren't on the same wavelength. And that word divided there means split into fractions. So remember I was saying about bit by bit by bit, and you start getting rid of the bits? You're splitting yourself into fractions. You could even be divided with the Lord. All right, the next one is inability to relate to others. Problems commuting, communicating with people. Have you ever met anybody who, when you're standing in front, they're always saying, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for breathing in your presence. I mean, I know that's kind of, but you know what I'm talking about. Like, they're an excuse. Like, they are, they're just always um, making, like, an apology for themselves. 
that could be a sign of spiritual rebellion. Broadcasting don't like me. Do you know that people actually, without words, broadcast don't like me? You send out vibes in the spirit realm that say, don't like me. It's a rejecting, causing spirit. And sometimes you ever meet somebody and you go, I don't even know why I don't like that person. They probably have a rejecting, causing spirit. You don't even make that. I don't know. I don't know why I don't like that person. Because I never even met you. But I kind of like don't like you. It could be something that they're throwing off. Reject me. Don't like me. Oh, that's, I'm, I got my pages all messed up here. Okay. Feeling out of place is a sign. Sexual problems, that you don't feel like you're a blessing to your spouse. That could be a sign of spiritual rebellion. Because you can't be a blessing because you're thinking bad things about yourself or they're thinking bad things about themselves and you can't be a blessing to each other. Dyslexia. This is where we're going to go into that. Dyslexia and how it's a disruption in one's space, time, language, or words. So I gave you a handout. You can just look at it. I don't know where it is in my pile, but you can just look at it later just so you can see the things. Op um, observation suggests that fear, anger, and fleeing back and resisting or rejecting life can cause a breakage. Or it might be that these things exasperate a pre-existing conditioning or scrambling in our inner selves. This scrambling, which is first experience in the spirit can be mirrored in the physical realm resulting in speech or um, spatial inversions so people that are very uncoordinated it could be that their body and their spirit aren't in alignment it's also you know your words come out backwards or your letters are transfer um Transposed, right? Is that or um, you write mirror? Like you can write mirror, like you know, like if you're looking in the mirror, you can write it the way it should look. I remember one time I went. My husband owned a store, and I went to his store. It was val the day before Valentine's Day, and he was right on South Street in Morristown. He had these two huge picture windows in his store, and I went there with a bar of soap. And I wrote on the window, will you be my Valentine? So that he could read it from the inside. But what I didn't realize when I was finished, that I had just written it mirror backwards without thinking in my brain. And it was perfect. And I was like, oh, this is very scary. And then when I read this, I'm like, Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> I got some work to do. <laughs> this is a few years ago. But I was just I stood there in amazement. I was like, how did I just do that without thinking? Because I had to do it fast because I'm like, oh, somebody's going to call the cops it's, that I'm vandalizing this building in Marstown. I have no proof that I own the building or that my husband owns the building. And, you know, the cars are going by and looking at me like, what is this lady doing with a bar of ivory soap on the window? Um, okay, it could also cause a destiny malaise. It's a vague or unfocused feeling of mental uneasiness, lethargic, lethargy, or discomfort. The heart, the sickness of the heart we experience when we believe we are missing part of the purpose of our life. You know, there's like kind of like a, you know, like there's a, I call it a holy frustration because the, God is never going to just leave you be. If you're not walking in your destiny and you're not fulfilling the purpose he has for you, there's always going to be a holy frustration. I call it a holy frustration because he's got to do something to make you so uneasy that you, because he needs you to step into your destiny, not for you, but for everybody who's waiting for you to step into your destiny. You know, there's people that are waiting for every person in this room to step into the fullness of their destiny. Do you believe that? There's people waiting for you. 
There's people that there's nobody else that can touch but you. God will finally bring somebody, but it might not be the same as if you did it. He, there's people waiting for you to arise into your destiny. That's how important this is. You can't, when you're in um, spiritual rebellion, you cannot fulfill your destiny with joy. Because joy and anger can't coexist. They're polar opposites. So if you're all angry at God because he didn't do well enough for you, how are you going to fulfill your destiny with joy? When he's saying, come on, Rachel, I got it for you, babe. Come on, I got great things for you. People are waiting for you to come into your destiny. Look why people are waiting for you to get into your destiny. There are people that you can touch like nobody else can touch. And those things that you've had victory over, that's your weapon. That's not something you want to throw in the garbage. That's your weapon. You have authority where you have gotten victory. That's where you have authority, the most authority. Somebody who's overcome drug addiction has way more authority to pray with somebody than I do. Now, somebody that had an eating disorder, I have a lot of authority there. But drug addiction, alcoholism, I haven't touched it. So I, not that I've never done either one of those things, but they never had me. So I had no victory. I didn't need victory over it. But somebody who's had victory, that's their sword. That's like where they can destroy the enemy with the most authority. Like think about where has the enemy tried to destroy you and get you in spiritual rebellion and get you to try to walk away from your destiny. Because that's where you probably have the most authority. Where has he tried to get you since you were about this big? Did he try to cut your voice off? Because that would tell you something. That the Lord gave you a voice that he wants you to use. Yeah. Whatever it is where the enemy has tried to destroy you, there's probably a purpose in your life that God had for you that the enemy tried to come and shut you down way early. That's what he does. All right. So the remedy for spiritual rebellion, Philippians 4.11, it says in the Amplified, it says, not that I speak from any personal need, for I have learned to be content and self-sufficient through Christ, satisfied to the point where I am not disturbed or uneasy, regardless of my circumstance. Regardless of my circumstance. And that's where Joseph was. Regardless of his circumstances, he was content. When you're content, it doesn't mean you have to like it. It just means you're content. It's like, okay, God, I know what you're doing. This might not be fun. It doesn't mean you have to be jumping for joy. Woohoo, I'm in a trial. This is great. I don't know anybody that does that. I'm sure when Paul was being persecuted, he wasn't going, woohoo, this is fun, getting rocks thrown at me. But when Timothy was getting stoned to death, he's asking God to forgive them. All right? I mean, talk about being content in whatever situation you're in. I don't know if I could do that. Okay, so we're going to pray this prayer, choosing life, okay? Go ahead, Kath. Yeah, I'll send out the notes. I don't mind doing that. Pastor will send them out. I don't have your emails, but I mean, I have some people's emails, but he'll send it out. All right, so you don't have to stand up because we're going to keep going on the dyslexia piece, but I'm going to read the back. There's two prayers. I'm going to read the top of 179, and then we're going to read together page 178, okay? And then this would be a good one to go home and do again and sit with the Father because we're going to go through it, but it would be good to sit with the Lord and go through it. All right. So, Lord, you could just shut your eyes for this part. Lord, I ask you to go back in time in every person in here's life when trust should have been built, but instead a crack was formed in the foundation of his or her life. Time and space didn't hinder you, Lord. So I ask you to minister to this little one, 
Your forgive, let your forgiveness flow towards the parents for their lack of affection and um, appropriate touch. Search out each person's wound and heal it, Lord. I ask you to sovereignly reach down and pick up this little one, ministering your comfort, nurture, and assurance. Communicate the delight you have in each one of your sons and daughters and let him or her know how much you cherish him or her. I ask you to hold this little one close to your heart, letting the strength of your spirit flow into his or her spirit and fill the cracks in the foundation with your strength and your solidity. Okay, now we're going to pray the other side. Okay, we'll pray it together out loud. Lord, I acknowledge that I have not chosen this life I would have never chosen my circumstances, my family, my personality, or my body. I have not understood nor appreciated how you formed me, and I surely would have never chosen to come into the pain of this life. I confess I am ha angry, having consciously believed that you could have done better for me. I have judged my family and authorities as lacking in ability wisdom and sensitivity and I have judged you as creating me as deficient I have come to see how others have wounded me and I choose to forgive and when you go home you can list the people I would that's what I would do for whatever this situation is my sinful responses have created trouble for myself and others I can see the damage that my rebellion has caused and I ask you to forgive me for the specific ways I have fl fled from life. You could just say that. For the specific ways that I have fled from life. And then go back and do that with the Father later. I know that I have wounded you by not receiving your gift of life and family. Even though I did not feel like a gift, nor did I feel gratitude for life, I choose by faith to accept my life myself and life you have given me as a blessing to you and to others. Jesus, I choose life. Help me to continue choosing you and choosing to be here. Lord, I ask you to open my eyes to see the gift of life. Release me into the abundant life you promise, the joy that comes from knowing that I am wonderfully made, a blessing to you and to my family and friends. Help me to know the abundant joy that comes from moving towards the destiny you have planned for me. Lead me into the joy of my birthright, the blessing of my inheritance in you. In Jesus' name, amen. I would totally encourage you to pray through this and fill in those blanks. But you know what? I'm going to ask you to stand up for a second because when we were praying that, I, I saw Chris Hayward when he was here. So just stand up for a second. And what we're going to do is we're going to say... You're going to, I'll tell you first, and then you do it. I choose life. You're going to point at, you don't have to do it yet. I choose life. I choose life. And then as loud as you can, I choose life. You're going to tell the devil you're choosing life, okay? So on the count of three, one, two, three. I choose life. I choose life. I choose life. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're going to do dyslexia really fast because it's late. All right. Res dyslexia, this is spiritual dyslexia. It can be the result of spiritual rebellion. The spirit of a dyslexic is turned backwards, looking away instead of towards life. So when the um, Sanford's were ministering, they had, you know, they always prayed and asked the Lord, like, how do we help this person? And they actually saw, they were praying with this little boy and who was very dyslexic. And they actually, the Lord showed them that he was inside his body. His spirit was turned backwards. So if I'm facing you, my spirit's facing that way. It's fleeing from life because of whatever traumas, whatever, you know, might have been spoken over you in utero, excuse me, whatever happened in utero. Um, 
You're fleeing from life. When you're in spiritual rebellion, you're fleeing from life. You're not running towards life. Whose idea is that? The devil. God wants you running full force ahead in life. The devil wants you running that way so you can't fulfill your destiny. And guess what? The person that you need to speak to so they get free or get saved can't get saved or get free. All right? Um, spiritual rebellion is fleeing from life as well. So it happens early in life. It happens in the womb. It happens in early childhood. And it's a fear... Um, in dyslexia, it's, it's severe enough to cause a child to emotionally flee or run from life, not wanting to be born or wanting to continue living. There's a death wish attached to it. When it's too hard, kids don't understand, and they just want to flee from life. Then you have a kid who's, you know, something happens and you had this lively child and all of a sudden they become very quiet, reserved and start fleeing from life. That's the enemy's plan. Flee from life when you're young and you never even think about destiny. You know, you crawl up in a ball and you don't become who God created you to be. The Sanfords in the wounded, Healing the Wounded Spirit said, we have consistently observed the same general conditions in those suffering from dyslexia it says, a woundedness in the spirit dating back to conception or infancy, fear or anger, fleeing back and rejecting life, and a result of breaking the inner harmony in a physical manifestation and a scrambling of your inner being. That's what happens with um, dyslexia, spiritual dyslexia. Um, it's usually dominated. Uh, dominant, it's a dominant emotion experienced by dyslexic people. Maurice, you can put that slide up, um, number five. Here's some of the symptoms of dyslexia. Speech inversion, thought inversion, spatial inversion, writing mirror image backwards, writing words or letters backwards, misspelled or um, missing word junctions, inability to tell your left from your right, um, flitting around and not following directions, not being able to finish a project, you know, like you see the little kid walking to school and they're kicking the leaves and kicking the leaves. They're supposed to be at school. It takes five minutes to walk to school and they're not there for an hour because they get so lost in what's going on. That could be a sign of... Um, not all the time. Kids do that. But, I mean, it, on a consistent basis, that could be a sign of spiritual dyslexia or dyslexia. We have prayed using the same basic ingredients, healing for the wounded spirit, forgiveness for rebelling and fleeing from life. Pray for the ability to forgive those from the past and the present who have wounded you. Praying, describing, um, describing the Lord is reaching in and turning your spirit around so you're facing forward and going into life instead of turning from life and being integrated and coordinated with the other parts of your person so that your spirit and your body are in one alignment and the power to choose life. Because when you're in spiritual rebellion, it's hard to choose life. It's hard to choose running into life when there's so much about you that the enemy has tormented you with about who you are and what you are not what you don't have, what God's not doing for you, what God hasn't done for you, what he's doing for so-and-so and not for you. It's easy to flee from life. It's easy to become depressed and... There's no joy in that. So when you're in it, you're running towards life. You're running towards the Father. When you're this direction, who are you facing? If you're not facing the Father, you're facing the enemy. He's ugly. You got to, oh, I got to stay over here. Thank you. Thanks for being my coach. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so when you're fleeing, you want to be running towards the father, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what you think isn't right, 
no matter what you think he's jipping you on. You know, how do you, you know, we think God's jipping us. That's an old word. I haven't said that word in a long time, right? <laughs> Showing my age. Um, but don't you, don't you feel like that sometimes? You're getting jipped. I hate getting ripped off. I do. I I hate getting ripped off. I love bargains, and I hate when I feel like somebody thinks they're getting over on me. I don't like that. But, you know, if you think about that, the en- when you fall into spiritual rebellion, the enemy's getting over on you every time. Amen. So when we're fleeing from life, we're running right into the hands of the enemy. Yuck. All right? So we're going to choose something different tonight. All right, so let's read this prayer, healing dyslexia. Oh, look at that. We could stand for this one. And then I'm just going to go back to that slide that we saw before because everybody was like, oh, I like that slide. Okay. Um, Prayer for healing dyslexia. All right, we're going to pray together. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and I confess that I have rebelled against my life, that I have run from life, that I have not embraced my life, and I have chosen death over life. I repent, and I ask your forgiveness. Today I choose life, not death, blessing, not cursing. Father, release me from the wish over my life, and I ask you to impart to me the gift of life you have intended for me. Father, I forgive you for the difficulty and the wounding of my life experiences, and I forgive my parents for unintentionally wounding me by not meeting my basic love needs. I also forgive others specific for their wounding in my life. So you can go back and pray that again as well. I choose to speak blessing over all of them in Jesus' name. And now, Father, I ask you to come in and reach into my life and turn my spirit forward. So I just want you to turn around. Turn your spirit. Just do a prophetic act and turn your spirit around. Okay, now from the other position, face the other direction and finish reading it. To face life. Reestablish perfect coordination left and right. Reintegrate and bring harmony between my body, my soul, and my spirit. Reconstruct my ability with time, space, and volume. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Help me, Father, to fulfill my God-given destiny in Jesus' name. I choose life. Choose life. Amen. All right, I'm just going to go back to that one slide real fast, okay? I'm not going to do... Um, there's a prayer in there for the spiritual um, orphan, so you can just look at that. But Marissa, can you put that other slide back up? Number three. It, I think it's number three. Yes, that one. Okay, so in your four basic uh, needs, there's the, the counterfeit affection And then there's the four basic needs. So when there's unconditional and unexpressed love, you're in a good place. When you don't get that, there's a passion that comes, but it's an unholy passion. And it breeds lust. All right? That's really key. It's a passion, but it's an unholy passion that breeds lust. When it's unconditional and express love, it's pure. It doesn't breed lust. When you have affection and affirmation, you're given that, you're empowered. When you don't have it, you seek position because you have to make a way for yourself. Then you seek position when that isn't met. When you don't have safety and security, you seek possessions because that gives you security. You think it does, but it doesn't. When you have purpose for living 
and it's God given, which he has given every single one of us. Cause he says, I have a plan and a purpose for your life. Every one of us, whether it's one talent or five talents, every single person in this room has a destiny and a purpose. That's awesome. I don't care if it's one talent, it's still awesome. And you just live that one talent to the best of your ability and you'll see that you could change a world. Okay? When you don't have a purpose for a living, you seek power. Because you're trying on your own. Then it's striving and manipulating and controlling to get power because you think that's going to do it. It's never going to do it. It's never going to fulfill it. There's always a deficit in that. But when you're living your purpose, oh, there's a freedom and there's joy and there's no striving. And it's just like, yay, God, thank you. Yay, God. And there is. It's like when you're doing, when you're doing what God created you to do, isn't it like, you know, we ministered at this conference and I mean, it was all day. I think we ministered to in about, Easter, how many hours it was um, the Del uh, conference in Delaware? How many? Yeah. It must have been. No, it was the one in Tom's River. Yeah, same thing. I think we ministered for, I want to say, six hours straight. I can't tell you how many people we ministered to in that time. But everybody's like, oh, are you so tired? I'm like, oh, no, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I mean, you felt so invigorated. It was like, oh, my gosh. Like, there was like, okay, walking in destiny. It was like, whoa, this is like incredible. Like, after every time and somebody got free, it was like, there was like joy. Like, joy filled you. I mean, we could walk out of the ministry room and be up there for five hours with somebody. And literally... When the person leaves, we're dancing in the fellowship hall. I'm not kidding you. Easter, am I telling the truth? Hollering, hooting, screaming, and dancing. When we see somebody get free, oh, my gosh, there is a party. There's joy that comes. When you're in your destiny and you're doing what God called you to do, oh, the joy of the Lord is your strength. But when you're seeking power, Oh my gosh, it's so exhausting. It what? Yeah, it's just exhausting. But when it's, you know that that's where God has you and you bloom where you're planted, even if it doesn't look great then, like Joseph did, remember, like you might be in a job that you don't like, but bloom where you're planted. Be a blessing. Serve God with all your heart and see where God takes you next. Don't rebel against the thing because you don't know what the Lord has. It's like, Lord, show me what the purpose is in this. Show me what the purpose is. Because when you don't, you just get angry. And then the enemy has a victory. And I hate when he has the victory. I do. I hate when he gets the victory. And I hate when I fall into the, to his trap and go, ah, oh, you got me again. I hate it. I like when I'm dancing around up in Fellowship Hall, hooting and hollering and screaming. I mean, screaming. Sometimes we're screaming. Sometimes we talk about it for the rest of the day. I mean, there is no greater joy than to see somebody get set free for me. Amen. That, might not be a, that might not be your thing. But for me, when I see somebody get free, oh, my gosh, there's a party in my heart. A party. I could do it all day long. You know, it's timeless awareness. I mean, sometimes it's not timeless awareness, but when it's good and God's moving, like, it, it's just supernatural, and you just like, whew. So don't let the enemy steal your destiny. Don't rebel against who God created you to be. Every bit counts. Remember that. Every bit counts. Every bit of your story counts. Redeem your story and use it for his glory. And I didn't mean to rhyme just then, but, <laughs> but really, just redeem it. 
Every part of it's redeemable. And God has a destiny for you and you and you and you and you and every one of us. Don't let the devil get you in spiritual rebellion where you're running towards him instead of, I'm keeping on a short lease here, instead of, instead of running towards the Father. And when you're running towards the Father, there's a whole bunch of people in the path that God has for you to touch. God, show me who they are. I want to run towards life that I could do what you planned and purposed for my life that there will be joy that can't be matched anywhere else. God, show me what it is. Sit with the Father when you go home and just ask him, you know, at a really deep level, forgive me, Lord, for where I have rebelled against life. And we all have done it. There's not one of us in this room that in some way hasn't done it. It's if you just don't like your feet, you've done it. Because God made those feet, right? It doesn't matter what it is. Every one of us has done it in some way. Maybe we didn't like our siblings. Maybe we didn't like our parents. Maybe we didn't like where we grew up. Maybe we did want to be born in a Victorian era instead of now if we had a choice. Maybe you wanted to be born in a medieval era. You know, maybe you wanted to be born when Jesus was here. Whatever it is that you aren't satisfied with, bring it to the Lord and say, Lord, I give this up. I'm sorry I rebelled against who you created me to be. And yeah, maybe my circumstances were stinky. But you know what, God? You even knew that. And you're going to use it for your glory somehow. Just remember that. If we give it to him, he'll, use it, well, he'll let us use it for his glory. And I'm telling you, when you get to use it for his glory, and I know most of you probably have already done that, there is no sweeter thing. Nothing sweeter than that. So you go kick some devil, you know what. After you go repent, then go. I love doing that. So I'm just going to pray for you. You could stand up and I'll let you go home. But read through that prayer um, of the orphan prayer I gave it to you. It's very much like uh, spiritual rebellion. But if you read through the prayer, you'll get the gist of the similarities, and it'll give you the thing. Because you don't want to be an orphan either. You have a good, good father, and he loves you, and he's so perfect, and he loves you perfectly. So, Father, I just thank you for each and every one of your sons and daughters that are here, God. Each one of them are so awesome, Lord God. I see the greatness on each and every one of them, Lord God. I see greatness on each and every one of them, God. They're spiritual giants. And I break off every lie of the enemy, every tormenting lie that tells them that they're anything but spiritual giants, Lord God. Anything that tells them, just like in the word where it says they, were, they said they were like grasshoppers. Lord, I break that lie off of each and every one of them right now in the name of Jesus. Father, you have created them to be spiritual giants to defeat the work of darkness, and to bring others to freedom, to share the love of Jesus in the fullness of who you created them to be, God. Each one will do it in their own special way, Father, because each one is so uniquely formed and fashioned bit by bit by the master creator who never makes a mistake, who never puts in a bad bit, and Father, I pull out every thread that the enemy tried to put in to, to mess up the bits. Father, I pull it out in the spirit realm right now. And I wash that place with the blood of Jesus. And I cancel its power and effect over each of their minds, souls, and bodies right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you that every bit, when you formed and fashioned them, Father God, was for a purpose that each piece that you put together so perfectly, Lord, is for a purpose. And Lord, even as we stand here, Lord God, every bit that has been uh, fractioned off, God, we call back to make them whole right now in the name of Jesus. Sanctify to make each one whole again, Lord God. Every bit that was put in a bucket or put on the side or on the shelf, Father, because it was painful or it didn't look right or it didn't feel right. Lord, that um, 
It didn't look like somebody else, God. We wash those in the blood and we call them back, sanctify to make us one in you, Lord God. And I thank you, Father God, that even as you have pulled back the cover on the enemy tonight, Lord, like you said when we were in worship, Lord, I thank you that each one will run towards life. Father, that they will run with a holy uh, wind behind them, Father, towards life, touching every person that is in their path between you and them, Lord God that the fire of God would consume them and be on them, Lord God, and consume every lie that has stood against the knowledge of who you created them to be. Father, tonight, they have all said they choose life. Lord, help them. Holy Spirit, walk alongside of them to help them to walk in this new way in choosing life. Help, them to be, help us all to be like Joseph, Lord, to bloom where we're planted in every situation so that you could you bring us to the destiny that you have for us, Lord. It might not be the second in command of a nation, but it'll be a second in, it'll be the place that you call us to, Father, that no one else could fulfill. So we just thank you for who you've called us to be for such a time as this, just like Esther, Lord God. Just like Esther, Lord, in 414, it says, perhaps you were created for this purpose. Father, we just thank you and praise you for the purpose that you have for our lives. And I bless every one of your sons and daughters to run towards life in this next season, Father, starting tonight and never looking back. And I just bless them. And I thank you for that you're such a good, good father and so faithful. And Lord, I ask that you bless them for their faithfulness to stay in even when it hurts, Lord. Even when it's hard, Lord, that they have the tenacity to stay. And Father, your, your word says that you reward those who diligently seek after you. So I just decree that the great is their reward in Jesus' name. Amen. It's you and me. We, we will have a prayer line, but it's just going to be Easter and I, so it will be... Oh, Martin, you're here. Okay. Maris, can you pray? Oh, and Claudette, I'm sorry. Good. We have two teams. I'm going to ask you that if it's related to tonight to come up, if it's something else, we could pray with you on Sunday, but since there's only two teams tonight, if you would just keep it to what we're um, praying for tonight, um, if you have, I don't want anybody to leave with an open gaping wound or something exposed that, you know, we were talking about that today. You know, you go to the, uh, a counselor that you pay by the hour and whether you're crying your eyes out at the end, they go, okay, your hour's up. Got to go. Bye. <laughs> so anyway, we just never want to open somebody up and leave them. So we'll see you next week. If you're coming to the conference, we'll see you on Thursday night. Um, but God bless you and thank you for coming out.